One step closer to an internet sales tax. Print a gun and then shoot it. European patent wars, modern day Bonnie and Clyde's, and much more. Hello and welcome to Tech and Coffee's Tech News Week. Today's Thursday, May the 9th. This is episode 46. And now, your host, Joseph Youssef. Thank you very much, Duke. I appreciate that. Today, my name is Joe Youssef. I am your host. But before we begin today, why don't we go ahead and introduce our panels. Duke, why don't you go ahead and start it off? Okay. Duke Carrico, Northeast Tennessee. George Dasher, somewhere in North Carolina. <laughs> my name's Guy Cook. I live near Seattle, Washington. Jeff Zayas. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. For now. Uh, Keith Milner, I live uh, just west of London in the United Kingdom. And I'm Robert Taylor. I'm a senior systems analyst in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you, guys. And, and uh, I want to give a special uh, shout out to Robert Taylor here. He apparently is our resident celebrity today. Uh, <laughs> apparently, he's going out to Congress and shooting out names and speeches and doing all sorts of things. Uh, Robert, do you want to talk about a little bit of what you just did uh, that's uh, apparently going all over the place now? Well, I, you know, real quickly, I, I will just tell you that we're using the power of tech to change the law. Um, Many people don't realize there was a Bigger Waters Act that passed in July of last year, and that particular act changes the rate for flood insurance across the country to some really astronomical figures. And uh, there's really a grassroots movement, and I'm participating in that. And uh, I addressed the parish council here where we live, and uh, they went to Washington, D.C., and took my speech with them. and. Uh, Apparently, it's had a pretty big impact, but uh, it's something that folks need to be aware of, and we're using technology to spread the word to try and get this law repealed. Wow. Okay, cool. Well, speaking of, of uh, Congress and legislation, all these policies, pol policies going out, what do you guys feel about this new Internet sales tax that's being proposed in Congress? It's currently, the Senate just passed an Internet sales tax in a final vote of 69 to 27. In this, uh, is this a sign that uh, local stores might get their advantage? I think it was bound to happen that, uh, I mean, they've been looking at taxing uh, stuff on the Internet for the longest time. Um, I, I think it, it was just a matter of time. Uh, a lot of online uh, online uh, stores actually do tax if uh, they happen to have a distribution center in your state. So if you're unlucky enough to be in a state where they have a distribution center, you get that sales tax for that state. Um, I, I'm not sure what this law is going to do, if it's going to cut back um, sales. I'm sure it won't, uh, but we'll see what's going to happen. I, I think I, I think it's dead. Like I say, the Senate passed it. It's still got to go before the House. I think it's going to face some really stiff opposition, and I think it's going to die right there in the House. I'm I agree. speaking from um, from the experience of a country where uh, we still pay sales tax if, or even on internet purchases. I don't think it will make any difference to people's buying habits because. People buy off the internet not just because it's cheaper, but because it's more convenient. Well, I can tell you, in California, like they had a big thing with Amazon for Amazon to collect sales tax for uh, California, and it took a couple of years for them to do it. Um, and I don't think it's affected Amazon at all in terms of their sales. So uh, um, I think it is headed that way. Eventually, it's going to be each state will adopt what they think is best for their. Um, you know, economic reality. So, how do you, how do you guys feel about how a lot of these internet e-commerce stores um, are going to change with in comparison to the physical uh, traditional stores? You know, stores like Best Buy compared to Amazon. Do you think Best Buy is going to get a leg back up on this? Never. 
I, I don't think so. I honestly don't. I mean, I think that the, I mean, price is, price is one of the reasons that people use internet um, shop, shops, but the, the reality is that the prices will still be cheaper on places like Amazon, even with tax, than, than places like Best Buy, because they've got to pay for real estate, oh. they've got to pay for staff yeah. to, to you know, sell staff and so on. Best um, Buy actually matches any kind of internet price. So that's how I got my, my camera really cheap because I, I printed out a price and um, Best Buy matched it. So they had that instant gratification. Um, you know, I had to pay the sales tax, but I got it right away. I didn't have to pay shipping. So, hmm, don't know. I mean, maybe it will give, give them a slight better push in that they can now match that price and including the tax. But uh, I don't know. I mean, in my experience from Europe, where we, we have to pay tax regardless of whether it's internet purchases or not, um, you know, it, the people are still going out and buying stuff from Amazon rather than going to the shops. Well, yes, I, I agree. But what I'm trying to say is that you know, Best Buy is preemptively trying to stop that. They're start trying to stop people coming into their store, looking at products, touching it, right, and getting used to the product and shopping it out, you know online yeah. and getting a cheaper price so what they're what they're doing is hey you're already in the store if you already know what you want and you have a matching price we'll, we'll meet it yeah, uh, hopefully it'll be successful but you know there's a couple of couple of companies in the UK who who tried something similar and they've gone out of business they just run out of money well I'm not going to say they're going to be successful but I like to argue with you what the heck <laughs> and, and it's good for the consumer you know anything well, like it's that. always good for the consumer you know well paying sales tax isn't but I mean competition is I'll, I'll be honest with you what I read on it a week or so ago it sounded like they hadn't even figured out how to do it I mean obviously it's it's gonna fall to uh, to these people to charge the sales tax but they uh, the last that I heard and they're probably gonna have to look at, at the European model Keith uh, to figure out, you know, just how, uh, so that they'll know what rate to charge, you know, and then how to pay them. How are they going to get the money to them once they collect it? So, yeah, I, I, I think there's still some challenges there they hadn't worked out. And and I, I'm going to be honest with you, with, uh, with the conservatives that uh, we have in Congress, I, I do not see this bill passing this time. It's been tried before. It hadn't worked. I know it passed in the Senate. But it's still got to go through Congress, and I don't think it will. Well, the only person who seemed to be against the bill, at least in the Senate, are the states that don't have a sales tax, such as I think it was Montana and a few others. But for the most part, everyone was in agreement with it this time around. Uh, and based on what you were saying before, Duke, I mean, do you think there, this is a sign of a model change for the United States with a value-added tax type uh, infrastructure? All, all I'm saying is, is it passed in the Senate. It has not passed in Congress, and I don't think it will. That's that's my only point. I, it's well, uh, I it, yeah, Con I, Congress I, I, is controlled by Republicans, and from what they've already said, there's a lot of Democrats and Republicans in Congress that are not supporting this, and that's why I'm saying it's not going to pass. Well, I'm going to speak from the standpoint of the small businessmen. You know, you guys know that. You know, my wife and I own a small business that is online, and we send uh, Christmas letters and Easter money letters all across the country, okay? And it is pretty difficult to keep up with the sales tax just for those sales that occur with inside Louisiana. I could not even imagine what it would be like to have to collect sales tax for all 50 states. In the area where I live, there's a small area of about three different parishes. We have parishes, not counties here. And all three of them have different tax rates. So depending on where the person lives that purchases our product, I have to charge the correct sales tax for them. Multiply that by every single county and parish across the country, and I may as well just fold up my doors. It's crazy. Of course, I'm no Amazon. But, you know, if the law is that i got to collect sales tax, somebody's mm. got to come up with one hell of a method for me to do it because I, I couldn't even imagine having to keep track of it myself. Yeah, I actually, there's services that you can supply. I actually wrote um, oil, oil transactions processing for 
transactions, uh, you know, between oil companies on a nationwide basis. And, you know, there's a, if you think it's bad for uh, just sales tax, you got to try to do underground storage tax, you know, highway, highway fees, all these other taxes. But there are services out there that um, I'll provide you with files that kind of do that. And also third-party services that would actually, you know, sure, take care of the whole make, processing for you. Make, make my product now be more expensive. Cool. Sure, I know there's Melissa data and those folks out there, and I can certainly subscribe to those, but ours is a small business. So now all of a sudden, because somebody in Utah wants me to pay them sales tax, I have to charge more for my product to cover the service to collect the sales tax for Utah. So you pay more, they pay more for sales because they're paying the sales tax and they're paying an administration cost. Right. So, you know, I, I hope Duke is right. I hope that this actually fails miserably in, in, in the House. I, I, mm. I really do. I hope it feel, fails miserably. But then on the other hand, there's lots of small merchants that have to compete with online sales and that they just can't. What, think, why you know, local you business in, you know, in, around, I right? The concept it's, is fairer that, that online, because, I mean, I looked at VoIP services a while back in the... Uh, in the early 2000s, and VoIP services and the economics of VoIP in in the U.S. and and most of the voice over IP services in the U.S. at that point in time were only cheaper, but simply because they weren't paying any of the taxes and the additional surcharges that were levied on fixed line carriers, and that was the only reason they were cheaper. And um, uh, it's very difficult to compete when you're, you you haven't got a level level playing field. But on the other hand. You know, if the implementation is so complex that it causes un undue cost and bureaucracy, then you know, that's a bad thing. Yep. Well, it's probably a simple fix. You could probably go by, you know, amount of sales that you do. Well, I think exempt. I think yeah. jo Joe brought it up, and, and I'm and I'm not opposed to this because I understand about the mom and pop, but make it a value added tax straight across sales tax across the board. And end all the nonsense. That 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 solves the dilemma. If, if the value added tax is eight percent or nine percent, and everybody's paying the same amount, then amen. Yeah, it doesn't. It won't. It will never work like that. You know, there's city taxes, county taxes, county sales tax. There's taxes upon taxes. It's. Just, it'll never work like that. There had to be a complete tax overhaul of the United States tax system, and that's not going to happen. People have done it. You know, uh, the Europe has started. You know, implemented it, and and uh, people in Asia have already started doing it because it was just a simpler way of doing things. Yeah. How long have they been yeah. trying to tackle yeah. tax reform or health care reform? Uh, it's just well, not going to happen. Well, well you know. Europe still have separate tax domains and separate tax rates. Yeah. So in some countries, tax rate, their sales tax rate is 20%, in other places it's 13%, and we, we still have to deal with that. But, but our, our jurisdictions are so much bigger, and the amount of cross-border traffic, sales traffic, is so much lower. That it's not so much of an issue. And it's just not United States. And Canada is the same deal, man. I mean, Canada changes by providence and uh, um, and. Uh, not territories, but whatever it is. So it's the same thing. They they have different tax rates for different areas. Uh, I'm sorry. Got a got a comment from James Swanson. He says he would never start a business if that happens. Well, you know, tax. Uh, you know, tax does make a factor in a lot of these uh, in a lot of business startups. The way investments are made. You know, James may not be the only one out there. So it's it's a very you know, you've got to look at the cost-benefit analysis for a lot of these. But anyways, if we're going to talk about uh, other uh, business adventures, how about the uh, the art of doing it yourself? Um, the first 3D printed gun was just fired on video. Blueprint files have been available and they've been made uh, online. Just a few days ago, uh, it was revealed that it's 3D printed uh, Liberator handgun uh, said to be the first. Uh, Defense Distributed now claims to have successfully fired a prototype weapon. Forbes documented uh, the test firing, which took place in uh, in the prairies of Texas, I believe it was, and it involved multiple, multiple practice runs where the trigger was remotely operated by string and varying levels of success. Finally, the distri Defense Distributed's proactive founder, um, uh, Corey Wilson, excuse me, Cody Wilson, 
fired the Liberator by uh, by hand himself, and the only damage to the gun was uh, was uh, was was the uh, a crack uh, where the barrel was, but it fired. It was fine, and the uh, user was fine. So let me ask you guys: Do you think we can register this weapon? I, I don't even think uh, it's not manufactured by a company licensed to to construct guns. So I would say no. Um, second of all, uh, because it is uh, like a, a resin plastic or whatever, yeah, I mean, because it will crack. Um, the gun will become dangerous at some point, two or three firings in. If the barrel cracks, it'll just explode eventually in somebody's face. Um, so it's not a safe gun. Um, it's, one of, it's probably a one-time, maybe two-time max use gun if you're going to use it by hand. So I, I, I can't see... I, I, I agree. And even the first time you're taking a risk, I mean, you could end up with a really high failure rate, like, you know, one in 20 of them blow up in, in someone's hand. People have been making guns for 100 years yeah. with, uh, with basically a pipe and a, and a nail, okay? Zip guns. A nail and a rubber band and a pipe. Zip People guns. have been doing it for years. This is no different, okay? It, it's, it's basically the same risk. Yeah, except that the yeah. only difference in this thing, it has actually, a, you know, a cartridge that actually, you know, would allow it to ha have more, you know, bullets that, you know, magazine, excuse me. So that's the one thing. But, uh, you know, I think they're going to clamp down on it as soon as it gets into real production. I honestly don't know how they can. Well, they can, they, there's existing laws that you cannot manufacture uh, a weapon that can be undetectable on planes. Uh, and and like you can't you you can take this weapon on, but the bullet is detectable. So so you can't load it. Okay, you can you can take it on a plane because it's plastic, and it might not register in some sort of a diagonal mm -hmm. X-ray. But if it's loaded, it's it's going to kick the. It will be seen. By the way, James Swanson said, "Are they going to regulate 3D printers because it can make a gun?" Uh, James, my answer. Uh, very sarcastically would be no they won't regulate 3d printers until someone makes a pressure cooker out of a 3D printer and then Diane Feinstein will submit some legislation to stop that I just got to correct you on one thing Duke you cannot it's not legal to take a plastic gun on a plane it is not legal that is not you can't you cannot create you cannot no, I, I mean, think he said it would get past the metal detector. No, but I'm saying it's not legal. Well, I, I, I you know, and you might be right. I'm yeah, not yeah, saying yeah. I'm not saying it's legal. What I'm saying yeah. is, is that if it's plastic, it's probably not going to register in an X-ray. Yeah. But it if won't. it's loaded, it will. Yeah, that's, of course. That's, that's my argument. Yeah, and the shape of it would probably show up on an X-ray. But what I'm saying is, it wouldn't show up in a, in a, if you had it in your pocket going through a metal detector. But obviously, through an X-ray in, lug in luggage, it would show up. But again, it's illegal to to have a uh, cons um, a weapon that is not detectable to, to be bringing it onto a plane. There is existing laws for that. But you know, having said that, you have a constitutional right to. Have a gun, bear a gun. Yeah, have a, uh, so. Um, well, and and here again, my argument, my argument here is this is this is really no different than me going to the hardware store and buying a three eighths eighths inch piece of pipe, drilling a hole in the side of it, putting a rubber band and tying a nail on it, and shooting a bullet, a thirty eight bullet through that pipe. And and let me tell you something, they've been doing it for years. This is no different. That I'm I'm not I'm not saying they should be doing it, but what I'm saying is is this is no different than that. My my main concern really is like George is I think it's an un, it's potentially unsafe, and I, and I agree that people have been making unsafe DIY knocked up guns for years, but I think this will this will encourage a new breed of of that, and you'll get kids who have access to their schools printer and trying to knock one of these things out and firing it and taking their hand off. And, um, you know, maybe that's just got to, the way it's got to be. Maybe maybe Darwin's law applies here. 
Well, Keith, what do you think about other things that those 3D printers can make? What about clothing? How do you feel about polyester? I mean, you're you're from an area of of really cool classic hippies. I mean, what do you feel about polyester over there? I mean, can, do you think we can get away with that? What? No, it's, it's, well, it's, I, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. I think they're afraid of copyright issues as well. You know, like, like min miniature things that you know have copyright. But um, I don't know. I. You know, Best Buy is going to be selling the printers in in, in thirty days. You can order it. So well, you're saying it's a consumer product, Jeff? It's going to be a consumable product, just like glass. Well, if you want to order something, think about ordering a Tech and Coffee T-shirt. We've got these nifty T-shirts, and then we actually have a, a prize. I think a bit on May sixteenth. Um, George, do you want to talk a little bit about the, that T-shirt? Yeah, that I'll, I'll let you guys know know what that's all about. Um, actually, in my lower third, it even has it. And if you uh, and, and if we click over to Joe's, I mean, on uh, Duke's screen, you can actually see the address. Um, if if you um, submit an email. And just basically subject could be T-shirt, anything I want a shirt, give me a shirt, something like that. But to uh, T-shirt at techandcoffee.info, um, you'll be eligible to win a prize. I believe the drawing is next week, if I'm not mistaken, on next the show. Thursday. Yeah, so next Thursday, we will um, randomly have somebody who has no access to the spreadsheet that we're putting the names in pick a number from one to whatever, and uh, that person will be the lucky winner. So um, either that or we'll have somebody generate a randomizer. I don't know. We haven't figured that part out yet. But uh, T-shirt at techandcoffee.info, you could be a lucky winner of a black version of our T-shirt. Unfortunately, I'm not wearing one today as I was last on the last show. I'm just wearing an AUG Camp T-shirt. But, you yeah. <laughs> know. Wow, thank you very much there, George. Um, uh, I guess our next topic that we're going to have to discuss then is going to be um, patents, 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 patents. Uh, it's been pretty interesting stuff going on. On Monday, the European Commission, uh, the, the executive body of the European Union, officially informed Google, owner of the Motorola Mobility, that the company's attempt to enforce an injunction against Apple in Germany on the basis of its mobile phone standard patents amounts to an abuse of dominant position prohibited by EU antitrust rules. I mean, guys, what happened? I thought we were all anti-Apple for a while. All of a sudden, the EU comes out and says, no, Google, hold on. What's going on here? Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy, man. I, uh, I I read the uh, the article and I was just really surprised by this, uh, especially given how the uh, European Commission came down about a year ago on Apple. And uh, uh, I I think this is just a sign that that everybody is sick of these daggone patent wars, you know. Except the lawyers. Yeah, good point. that's a very good point. But all these guys people, have their lawyers the on people, staff. Yeah, the only people that profit from this adventure of patents, the only people that win every time, whether their client wins or loses, are the lawyers because they get paid either way. Yeah, but like for Apple and Google, they have their own set of lawyers. They they probably don't outsource oh, yeah. that. Yeah. So I I would say, being European, I would say I I have very dim view of the of the of the. Um, neutrality or otherwise of the European Commission um, there are in my view people within that organization who have um, commercial influences and at the moment there is a very big anti-Google um, wind blowing in the European Commission so I wonder how much of that has been influenced it's commercial influences I like that's a very nice way to see it that is that is pretty awesome. Now, I mean, but basically the EU is saying uh, you can't do this. But wasn't Apple just doing it? I mean, what what what's the difference between what Apple was doing and what what Google is doing right now? The, the difference is friend. The difference is that friend is a specific um, condition that that says that. You know, companies like, and, and it's reasonable because what it is saying is like a company like Motorola who's, who's created a technology and wants that technology to be used widespread, 
says that they will allow that to become part of the standard that everybody else uses as long as they don't abuse that privilege. So they're, they're entitled to, to get some compensation for it, but they're not allowed to abuse that, that right because they have effectively been given um, effectively a market uh, by, by having their, their technology embedded as part of the standard. And, but I got that, but that's not what the EU is saying here. Specifically what it says, they're trying to enforce, quote, an injunction against Apple in Germany on the basis of its mobile phone standard essentials patents. Okay, so that says to me that Google is saying, hey, we don't want you uh, to, to utilize our technology. And the EU is saying, oh, no, you can't do that you're, because you're using a dominant position prohibited. Well, Apple had a dominant position forever, and they used that position to crush everybody they could. Now that Google's doing it, EU is saying, no, you can't. It's a little late to the game after Apple collected the billion dollars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But the difference there is that, um, and I totally agree, because I think that what Apple were were suing people like Samsung for were effectively even more fundamental than, than the um, patents that, that Motorola had, because the patents that Motorola have are genuine innovations that they've created. Um, Not just rounded corners. Exactly. But the difference is that effectively by giving them the, the, the whole friend thing, it is, it is definitely about friend, the whole friend thing, the fact that they've been effectively embedded into the standards into the standards that are, that are part of everyday life and mobile phones means that you cannot buy a mobile phone without that or those those patents actually embedded into your into your phone it's just impossible to you can't avoid it in any way and because of that that effectively has given them a dominant position because they could then turn around and effectively bully other vendors into paying more than others or or, or say no, I'm not going to let you use that, use that technology um, in your device because I don't like you. And the whole point of Friend is to stop that happening. And they've signed up to it as Motorola Mobility, and now they're basically turning around and saying, well, actually, no, we want to charge you guys more, is, is what the EEC are saying. However, what, in my view, what's actually happening is they, because Apple have done this before, is that Apple have basically said, no, we're not going to pay anybody else for their patents because they've done it with Nokia and they've done it with um, Huawei and they've done it with a few others, they basically refuse to pay for the patents, even you know anything. And then when those companies have gone to them and said, um, come on, you've got to pay us something, they've, they've thrown their hands up and gone, abuse of power, abuse of power, friends. And I think that's what's happening here is, um, you know, they're, they're basically uh, playing the friend card to, to avoid paying anything. Don't know. Yeah. It's, sure. all, it's, it's all about lobbyists. Well, thank you very much, guys. That was really helpful. Um, now, those Sorry, you're low. Audience who uh, feel they need to uh, contest us. Oh, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that. Now, for those of you uh, audience members who do wish to contact us, please, uh, you can contact us either via Twitter. Or Facebook. Uh, Facebook, you can uh, add us at, at uh, Tech and Coffee One. Uh, if you wish, you can also uh, Skype us at Duke.Carico. Or if you want to look us up in G, where we usually tend to hang out at uh, Tech and Coffee. Uh, and you can always email us at uh, TNW at Tech and Coffee One dot info. Uh, they got some Twitter hashtag thing. I'm one of those anti Twitter guys, but I know it's all popular for you guys. I know it's the social multimedia thing, but I definitely encourage you guys, whether it's just Twitter or Facebook or, or G, to always contact us if you need to. Um, but, uh, anyways, we're going to go ahead and discuss our next topic, guys. Uh, and it's about Bonnie and Clyde. Well, Bonnie and Clyde ain't got nothing on these guys. Apparently, eight people are being charged for online bank robbery. Eight are the eight are charged allegedly for making 3,800 separate transactions in order to withdraw 2.8 million dollars into prepaid Mastercards. 
forty-five million dollars in total. I mean, guys, do we really need to worry about the that uh, plastic gun anymore? I mean, people can do it from the uh, the privacy of their home. I have visions of office space here with the uh, you know the guys putting the virus in the computer and then having like two hundred grand the next day or something like that. I, I don't know. It's uh, it's been it's been done before in in different avenues, but yeah, this is. Uh, this is just uh, another way of uh, robbing a bank, as we see, and uh, and I'm sure uh, there'll be even more ways if they put a stop to this. So. It, it makes me wonder what their audit system is at these banks. If they don't find out about it until after $2.8 million has gone through the pipe with 3,800 transactions, um, their fail-safe system isn't very safe in my mind. Um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong because some of you guys work for banks, is that banks move their transactions on its own separate um, connectivity, its own backbone if you will, and it's separate and apart from public internet as we know it, and that's Absolutely. why things don't get broken. There's so much like SWIFT, which is, right. a, which is right. a separate network. Right. So, so th the first words that popped in my head when I saw this, inside job, has to be. You know Somebody that, someplace give it up. If you actually look at the details of what they did, they hacked into the bank's computers. Um, so, yeah, I do think it is an inside job from that point of view. But they, they did it in, um, they basically did it in the Middle East, where clearly the, the, the security measures being taken are not as good as they would be in some other countries. Wouldn't seem uh, so. And they well, basically topped up their cards, so the, the, the prepaid cards actually had more credit on them than, than the value that they purchased for. Don Henley said it best, a man with a briefcase can steal more money than any man with a gun, be it 3D printed or otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the amount of transactions that flow through a bank, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm sure it's, it's hard for them to reconcile all that. You know, it's really hard to figure out that that is that transaction is uh, was overcharged for whatever it was. Just the credit card yeah. fraud is just rampant. So you know, the uh, it's just crazy. Yeah, well, guys, should be be should the U.S. and and other governments be more spending more money on cyber terrorism and cyber attacks and cyber hacking than it is to buy a tank? What do you guys think about that? Wait, the, why, why is this the United States problem? Well, uh, allegedly the eight guys were in New York. So okay. they okay. basically... Why is it the United... You said, should the United States spend more money? It's not a United States problem. No, no, no. I said United States and other countries, meaning the United States has to worry about cyber attacks from itself as well as other countries having to worry it's about cyber attacks. This is not a cyber attack. Cyber attack, yeah. This, this is somebody who went into a store and pulled out a gun and robbed them. It's exactly the same. Now, does that mean that the United States needs to go and hire a guard to protect that store? That's MasterCard's problem. Their system was breached, and they are responsible. That's one of the things that I, I, I hate when we start to confusing a cyber crime and it being a United States problem to solve. This store got broken into. That's yeah. not the U.S.'s problem. Stop has spending it, my tax money, Joe. Yeah. Has has anyone yeah. gotten a, a charge on their credit card that wasn't theirs? Once. Yes. They tried to do it. mine one time. Okay. They caught them in the process of doing six dollars and thirty-eight cents over in Idaho. They, they froze the card, couldn't be used for anything, anywhere, anytime, and Valerie ordered me a new number, and I had a new number in a few days. And so, yeah, problem solved. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. It's so, it's everywhere. There's three people in here who had erroneous credit card transactions out of, out of two, four, six, seven, right? No, I didn't have an erroneous. They caught mine. It but didn't, it, I didn't cost me a penny. No, no, but it the, the went through. It no, was an it, attempt. And it was an attempt. It was a thwarted attempt. The okay. security worked. Okay. All right. Well, let me let me rephrase it for the the for the panel then. 
there has been out of out of the seven people in here, there has been three attempts on three separate people, uh, whether it went through or not, of erroneous transactions. Well, yep, let, yep. Let, let that's me a correct, that a correct statement. Let, let me tell you about mine. Oh, then there's more. There's I, I, I bought I bought a NBA jersey from the NBA store online for my son. And the employee or a employee who worked for that NBA store stole my credit card information. Okay? Now, let me tell you something. The NBA store was on it as soon as it happened and contacted me. But it was no different. What happened at this with, with my transaction would have been no different if I'd been out at a restaurant and paid for my meal and handed the waitress my credit card, and she took back and wrote down the information. That's exactly what happened in the NBA store. Okay, so uh, I, and and that's to Robert's point. Okay, it's crime. I don't care if it's electronic crime or not. It's still a crime, and we have laws in place for those crimes. Yes, and then and then it's it's the duty of the credit card and each individual to make sure they they monitor their transactions on a monthly basis or whatever they put in like um, on my credit card if anything is over twelve hundred dollars I get an email alert because uh, that's going to be an erroneous transaction for me you know because I don't usually spend twelve hundred dollars a pop unless I know about it right so I mean you can do it yourself and uh, um, but it's it's going to be out there forever. You know, it'll be out there forever. It's I no think, uh, Joseph, I, I think, you know, we've got a stupid tech moment that we try to do weekly on this show. I think this is a a very intelligent tech moment. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't think it was cool if, you know, it was my money that got stolen. But uh, I do think it's kind of cool that people can sit around and, and figure out these ways around these systems. And let's face it, at the end of the day, things like this make us safer, okay? And they got caught. So. Yeah. And they got caught. Yep, that's the important thing. So, And I we think, uh, get to I, learn from what they did and try to prevent it for, for a future. And I think Dan Nichols sums it up correctly. I believe you have my stapler. <laughs> 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 All righty, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next topic. Um, Netflix is a new on the news again. Netflix is actually trimming its catalog by removing 1,794 items from its list. Uh, is this a good thing? I mean, just when you hear a lot of good things, they do something else. I mean, uh, how is this going to affect the trend uh, to pull the plug, guys? I like it. I like the fact that Netflix has come to the realization that they're in touch with their uh, subscribers. People are saying, why do you have these old B-movies that nobody's going to watch in there? Why don't you get some new stuff? And so they're making an effort to do that. I think that the uh, energy that's behind the Netflix for original programming content is going to help people cut the cable when they see that there's options available that are more than just looking at videos on YouTube. I'm with Guy on this. I, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 cruel Intentions a Big Daddy. Okay? I've seen them both. I don't want to watch them again. Get them off of Netflix. That's just something else. That, that's something less that I have to sit through to find something I want to watch. Okay? Uh, and, and this, I, I, I'm going to vent this while I'm here. I'll still yet say the Netflix interface sucks. Okay? I, I mean, you just... Man, I spend more time trying to find a movie than, than I do watching one when I do find it, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I, I have no problem with it. I, I say thumbs up to you, Netflix. Yeah, get rid of some other crap. And, and by the way, man, uh, uh, your original content, I, I'm, I'm rocking it, man. I love it. Well, I, I happen to disagree on two counts, okay? Number one, I want to know why you removed these 1,700 and 1,800 or so uh, items. Why? Is it a cost-cutting measure? Is it lack of user interest in those products? What is it? And the other part is, is 
sometimes you might have a movie that you haven't seen for three, four, five years, and then all of a sudden it would be funny to see again. So we know that we're not going to have an online repository that's going to have every movie we ever want to see, but at the same time, I want to know what 1,800 items you're putting back. It's one thing to say you're taking it away, but they're really slow to put new content on. They did come out with that series just recently that was a runaway hit. I got it, but we need a lot more. If you're going to take stuff off, you need to put more stuff on. So tell me what you're taking off and tell me you're going to put something back on. Expand the library and definitely improve the interface. Duke, you're right. I mean, we, we do have people who do like to watch the classics. I mean, George, you're from that generation that likes to watch black and whites. So. <laughs> what the heck, man? No, uh, I, I, I've, I've, yeah. wouldn't you I be like upset black and white movies? took away but... your, your uh, Apocalypse Now? I mean, well, no, 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 but, but they're taking Laurel away and Hardy. intentions, which is not that old of a movie. So, I mean, if you think about it, Joe, they're, they're not just removing the older movies. They're removing the movies that were made 10 years ago as well. I, I like Cruel Intent. See, that's, that's Robert's point. What are you removing and why? Is it because people aren't watching it, which then makes sense? Or are you doing it just because you don't want to pay the licensing? I'll, I'll uh, didn't, they remove, didn't they remove the stars? Yes, yeah. yeah. They, all, so, all the stars content, they... Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, Stars wanted a, a a huge contract. They wanted. Uh, uh, don't hold me to this. I was thinking it was almost a half more than what they'd gotten on the last contract. Netflix wouldn't go for it. Uh, li listen, uh, I I'm going to caveat what I said earlier. I'm going to give it this caveat. I'm hoping that they're dropping these 1,794 pieces of content to buy new content. Okay. Those of us that have been on Netflix now for about five or six years, uh, we're, we're running out of stuff that we really want to watch. Okay? Oh, agree. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of stuff on Netflix I hadn't watched, and the reason why is because I don't want to watch it. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even Google's starting to get on board with that now. Um, Netflix just started doing its all us. Uh, um, Netflix only uh, TV series. Uh, uh, just today, there was an announcement that YouTube is doing its own premium channels. Uh, if you were saying this about Netflix, what do you guys feel about Google now? I mean, we were used to it being free. Why are we charging? I mean, Amazon has its own uh, online only content as well. They've got a huge library of of stuff they have just on Amazon for Prime members. So. And, and Joseph, I, I know you're transitioning into the next article, but let's face it: they uh, uh, Warner Brothers pulled their stuff off of Netflix because they're starting their own subscription service, okay? And uh, they're going to be charging ten dollars a month to watch, uh, 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 you know, Warner Brothers stuff. Now, I just tell you right now, I'm not interested, okay? Okay, there's one last comment from Dan Nichols. We'll probably change the subject on this. Well done, Joe. Apocalypse Now is the best black and white movie ever. <laughs> black and white and red all over. Anyways. Uh... Uh, it's a great comment. That's right. That's right. As far as, far as the YouTube thing, uh, I haven't made up my mind if this is a good move or not. Uh <laughs> I understand that it, it is in beta. I, I read something today that uh, uh, they're, they, they've they given this to a few select testers to where, you know, we can start charging for content. You know, Sesame Street is, is one of them that's going to be a paid service. I, you know, is it just me? or I mean, I remember when Sesame Street used to be brought to my kids by, you know, the number seven and the letter J. You know, now, now we're going to have to pay for this stuff, you know? So well, here, here's the thing. Uh, what I disagree. Sesame Street is a publicly funded show, right? It's it's publicly yes. funded. It's PBS. I mean, we already paid for it, so it should be free regardless. Well, it's a uh, it's going to be one of the uh, uh, subscription services. Ninety nine dollars a month or uh, ninety nine cents a month, I believe, is what they're going to charge for it. It's interesting. Wait, a hundred dollars a month? There better uh, be like, ninety-nine cents a month. Okay. 
If if that if that goes back to PBS, I would be for it. If it goes back to the programming aspect to fund it, I would be for it. I'm, if it just, I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing uh, Google's getting part of that. Google's going to get part of that subscription service, yeah, and yeah. then whoever's providing it's going to get the other part. I mean, my my point of view is I I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because um, I think there is it would expand the range of content on Google on YouTube um, because there's content that people would want to pay charge for but they didn't have a way of doing it other than maybe to push it out onto iTunes yeah. um, and now they've got a way of doing it. I mean, I know I know a number of channels that. They could probably monetize quite easily, and people would be prepared to pay a small amount per month to subscribe to them. Haven't we um, all been saying that we wanted a la carte services? Isn't this the first one of the steps to having it? I think it is. It will. Yeah. It will. It, I think it will expand the range and the quality of the material because, yeah, there'll there'll be some crap out there that people will try and charge for, but um, ultimately, you know, it'll it'll fall down to people will only be able to charge for high quality. Well produced content, and um, I like yeah. what Amazon's doing with their uh, Prime content. They've got a number of pilots on Amazon Prime that you can go in and watch, and then you can comment directly to Amazon via the website. Yeah, I liked this one. Nah, this one not so much. There's about I think there's 15 pilots that are set up that way. Yep. All right, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> What's wow, that, I, I really figured you guys would be a lot more talkative and much more emotional about uh, 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 pulling the plug, Netflix and and uh, Google YouTube and and uh, and what was the other one? Amazon coming out there. I mean, with its with its own stuff or possibly its own stuff. Who knows? But um, I think then if we're going to be discussing all that, I guess we're ready for our stupid tech moment. Who wants to discuss that? Well, uh, how much of the stupid tech? Oh, yeah, they've taken it offline here. Oh, I love that video that we're going to show. The Saturday night. There it is. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not letting me play it. Maybe maybe I can find it kind of quick on uh, YouTube. But yeah. <laughs> It was uh, it, it was so good, man. And my eyes, my eyes watered. I laughed so hard. Yeah, that's great. I think there's a lot of truth to that, don't you? <laughs> when he's talking about being a pigeon, and he's going like this. Peacock. <laughs> Peacock. 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 <laughs> Peacock. <laughs> Peacock. Oh, there it was classic. He just came up. Hey, just a second. All right. Update tech correspondent Randall Meeks. <laughs> That was just too funny there, dude. I want to see Jeff do that. <laughs> I, I can see him doing that, too. I definitely I can see it. Um, yeah, so I guess it is the consumer product. Uh, you know, but, yeah, the SNL does bring up a good point. If, SNL, if iOS is autocorrect, it can produce so many issues with, with uh, autocorrection. Could you imagine all these facial twitches and, and voice-controlled smart commands when I say... You know, go yeah, go go do something with yourself, Jeff, and you know Google Glass tries to do something with Jeff's contact information. I would think Jeff was having a convulsion or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think it actually is like that, but you know, obviously it's it's a good takeoff on it. But it's interesting that it made it to SNL. You know, so that's that's yeah. well, that's that yeah. just just the fact that SNL spoofing it ought to tell us that uh, uh, Google Glass is there's a lot of buzz about it outside of the tech world in Google Hangouts. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, that, and we also know what demographic they're targeting. Comedians? Saturday Night Live fans. Wow. <laughs> that's 7.6% of the nation that's unemployed that can stay up that late. That can't afford Google Glass. <laughs> that watch it on TV. Yep. That, that's believe, uh, uh, e even though it was funny, I mean, let's face it, guys, we already know that uh, we've got developers out there, one that can, he, he's activating stuff just on a slow blink, okay? 
You're not even going to have to say, okay, glass photo. It's taking a photo if he blinks. So, uh, well, yeah, because look, no, look at you, that Larry's setup, that Vanguard setup. He stares at a letter for three seconds, and it types it. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it's a blink. I think it's a wink. You wink, a pronounced wink, and it'll take a photo. Yeah. Okay. Jeff, wow. blocking you. You've corrected me again. <laughs> a blink, a wink. A oh, blinks are quick. I mean, imagine how many photos it would take in a day. I said well, a, I slow, mean, a slow blink. Maybe you don't have to ban Google Glass after all because people can tell then when you're trying to use it because you go into this entire convulsory, you know, stance when you're trying to operate the darn thing. Who knows, you know? Yeah, it's not like that. But, yeah, I think there's been a couple of really cool video videos about Google Glass and its functionality, what it really is and what it really isn't. Uh, CNN did one, I think, or I know Duke posted one. CNN. CNN, CNN, yeah. A very good article just about what Glass can do. It's a, it's still, it's a very excellent article. You know, for 1500 bucks, there's still no way I would purchase it. What? <laughs> what? Wait. That, that was, the Martians have come and taken Jeff away because it's the first time I ever heard Jeff Zayas say I wouldn't buy Google Glass. For $1,500. Oh, no. please, Jeff. You know you'd buy it. You just return it the next day. No. <laughs> 500 bucks, I think, is a $500 deal. Okay. 1500 let, let, is let me ask you something. I, I'm, I'm curious. And... and I think it's going to have to do more before I'd pay five hundred dollars for it. Okay, but but as it is right now, which is basically you're getting some Google Now information, you can take photos and videos and do a Google Hangout. Okay, that, that's pretty much the functionality of it. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how, how much would everyone in here pay for that? Okay, because I I'm thinking I'm thinking maybe two hundred American dollars for me right now with what it's doing. That, that I said, would be uh, where I would might consider it. Might. Yeah, I would go higher than that. Well, okay. I'm, I mean, let's face it. Hey, I can do every bit of that with my phone, almost as conveniently, hmm. and, and, and in some cases, them. maybe more. And the bill of materials of them isn't isn't apparently that much either. It's so it would be possible to make them for and sell them for quite a low price. Uh, it's uh, basically the teardowns that I've seen. A couple of people have teared them down. There's less than $100 of parts in that thing if it's mass produced. Less than $100 in parts. Exactly. Well, there you go. So $200, everyone would buy it. Yeah. Well, wow, guys, that was a pretty good show. We're, we're almost done with it, uh, but I think all we have left is uh, Espresso. Derp expressive. Expressive. Um, I, I'm not sure what this first thing is. It's scary. Um, it's called Cross Loop Remote Desktop, and it looks like you can pay about seventy dollars a year for a pro version. I posted that, George. You posted it. Okay. Okay. Let me tell you about it. You, why don't you tell me about it? Okay. This morning, my dear mom had problems on the computer. My good friend Robert Taylor, senior network administrator in New Orleans, Louisiana area, said, you know, you ought to try this cross loop. It's so easy that my mom could do it. She just went to the website. I said, click on the blue button to download it, mom. Okay, you see that little code? What's that code say? Bada boom, bada bing, I'm in her desktop. It's that easy. So if you need to help your mom with remote desktop, try cross loop. You don't have to pay $69 unless you're going to put it on your website. You want to use it one time, it doesn't cost you a penny. Absolutely free. And uh, for what it's worth, I just went to the website, and it looks like several of my Facebook friends have used CrossLoop. So what's yep. the advantage of that over, like, TeamViewer? It is, is pretty... super, super easy to install. Yep. Download, the... run... Next, next, finish, and it's done. No yep. firewall screwiness, nothing, you know, nothing like that. Once it's finished the install, the user's presented a screen with a little code on it. They read that code. You put that code in on your cross loop, and you instantly have control over their machine. Um, works very, 
very well. Easier than TeamSpeak or the Chrome Remote Desktop. Super, super simple. And one last thing on Exp Expresso to get us under 60 minutes. The May 14th Microsoft update is going to have 10 bulletins in it. So watch for that next Tuesday. Uh, Guy, what is a typical Microsoft release on the monthly updates? Typical? Uh-huh. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. You know, I was wondering when I was reading this, and, and I didn't know if, if 10 was a heavy number or not for a, a monthly update. That's, why, that's the reason why. Oh, no, it's just they're pre-announcing it because they've already set in stone this is what we're going to roll with on Tuesday so we're going to put it out through via CERTIS, the National Cyber Awareness System mm -hmm. um, that George and I I think are the ones that subscribe to maybe yeah, Keith does and and they just did a blah 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 about it it was a slow news day maybe I don't know but but that's what's coming down the pipe very good Okie doke. Um, well, let, let's announce this again. First of all, uh, uh, the t-shirt at techandcoffee.info, when your very own black and white t-shirt, Tech and Coffee. Um, not sure the sizes that are available, but uh, we'll try to find one that fits you. Uh, medium, through, at, medium through 3X, George. Medium through 3X, so that, that makes more sense. Um, so if you're within those sizes, or if you think you can fit within one of those sizes, you can get one of those shirts, uh, t-shirt at techandcoffee.info. We have a drawing next week to win one of those t-shirts. Thank you. Right here on this show. Next right here on this show? Night. Yep. Wow, guys, thank you so much for that. And for those of you out there who wish to join us again, please come join us. Uh, you can reach us out via Twitter using uh, our hashtag, uh, TAC Hangout, or you can reach us on Facebook using Tech and Coffee One. You, uh, G Plus, we're always hanging out in a hangout somewhere. At uh, Just search for us for Tech and Coffee, and you can find our hangout by going to our website. Uh, techandcoffee.net um, if you wish to email us tnw at techandcoffee.info guys this is uh, Joe Youssef and the rest of the Tech and Coffee crew thank you and enjoy you've been listening to Tech News Week a weekly series where we talk tech brought to you by Tech and Coffee a Google Plus hangout we want to invite you to check out our Hangout. You can do so by going to techandcoffee.info and clicking on Join the Hangout, where you can find a link to our existing Hangout. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Tech and Coffee one We appreciate you joining us and... Uh, Y'all come back now, you hear?